Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Three-Phase Approach to Data Quality, with Igor Greisnov, CTO and co-founder of BigEye. Igor is going to discuss an approach to data quality that comes from his experience at Uber as one of the early data employees, conversations with customers, and hundreds of conversations with data engineers from across industry. So now I'll hand things over to Igor to get started. Thanks, Nolan. Hi, everyone. I'm Igor Grasnov. I am the co-founder and CTO of BigEye. Before starting BigEye, I was at Uber, where I was an early member of the data team there, working on the data warehousing solutions at, uh, at Uber. That included infrastructure, ETL tooling, data modeling, uh, reporting, so on and so forth. A lot of what I learned at Uber about scaling data and managing it uh, in an efficient manner, I've been able to take and apply uh, with through BigEye in order to solve the uh, same problems that I've solved before and help other teams get to the same point. What we're going to be talking about today is the, a three-phase approach to data quality. This is a framework that we at BigEye use uh, mostly due to seeing it repeated multiple times across a number of industries and businesses. We're going to start off with the data quality challenge and why should, are we talking about data quality today? We're then going to talk about this three-phase approach and how you progress in your data quality evolution. We're going to talk about the journey that most companies take um, through as they go down the data quality path, some pitfalls that we've commonly seen, as well as pitfalls that I have personally fallen into myself. And finally, we're going to round out with how Big Eye can help you along on your journey and what the solution provides today. So let's talk about the uh, data quality challenge and why it's so important today. Here at Big Eye, we see data engineering evolving uh, similarly to how software engineering evolved over the last 20, 25 years. If you look at the software engineering side of uh, the timeline, you'll see that software engineering uh, and DevOps really started um, due to easy access to infrastructure. Before AWS and GCP, applications were custom built and deployed on bare metal servers. Someone had to manually manage all the infrastructure themselves and software was highly uh, custom. With access to easy infrastructure in the cloud, developers could now spin up a new a server, a new database with the push of a button. And this made it very easy to get your application, uh, write it, deploy it and start uh, using it in production very quickly. Because it's so easy to deploy all these applications quickly, so the software engineering uh, uh, roadmap then turned to deployment automation, where changes to a software one, uh, were deployed automatically to all the production systems. You had hundreds, if not thousands, of different services within your application that all needed to be coordinated and tools like uh, GitHub, Jenkins helped with a lot of this automation and testing and getting your code to production. And finally, as more code is being shipped to more services, you run into the problem of monitoring and observability. You, it's when you have five or 10 applications, it's very straightforward to write custom health check scripts and understand what is the state of them and whether they are um, available or not. When you scale to hundreds and thousands of services, it becomes very difficult to understand the uh, overall state of the system. And so monitoring and observability is critical in order to know where are the problems in your systems and how to resolve them. The, this then led to uh, tools such as Datadog, uh, New Relic, Dynatrace, AppDynamics that allowed software engineers to easily and efficiently monitor the state of their systems. 
the data engineering landscape is evolving down a similar path. In, uh, data warehouses that were large applications that were manually deployed, very custom rollout scripts have turned into cloud data warehouses. BigQuery, Snowflake, and Redshift have made great strides towards being able to deploy a data warehouse without to any custom configuration or scripting. Now that data teams had easy access to data warehouses, the next uh, problem area was getting data into the warehouse. And so in order to facilitate that, you have ETL and ELT platforms such as Fivetran and Stitch that help you take all of the data from the different systems in your organization and in your business and combine them all into your, this, your central data warehouse that's already in the cloud. And following the same pattern in software engineering, now that you have uh, easy access to data, uh, there's more data available and it's all in a central location that you want to use for some business purpose, you need to understand what is the state of your data at any point in time. Big Eye aims to solve the problem of monitoring observability, but for the contents of your data warehouses uh, and your analytics solutions. So why is data quality a problem today? Well, as we, as we talked about, the, cloud, uh, the availability of cloud data warehouses and um, one-click ETL solutions means that smaller data teams are able to tackle bigger data problems. Before you might have five to 10 pipelines per data engineer that they are very familiar with and they understand all of the intricacies of the pipelines as well as what the data looks like. Today, you, we see teams of three to four data engineers and data scientists managing hundreds of pipelines across the whole business and performing analytics on a very wide range of data sources. Because the data team's goal is to move faster and uh, bring on more different data sources, data quality tends to slip through the cracks because the goal is to move faster with your data. And so there's less time spent on manually verifying that the data is of high quality and is in a usable state. Now, what does that mean for the business? Well, it turns into a very expensive problem to ignore. Gartner conducted a survey that estimated uh, that data quality costs an average organization almost $13 million per year. And with machine learning and AI being very popular topics today with a lot of teams moving towards building automated solutions that incorporate some form of machine learning, a lot of these projects aren't successful because of data quality issues. Uh, surveys have found that about 87% of all organizations can't successfully implement an ML initiative simply due to data quality issues. This is where the phrase garbage in, garbage out really comes into play and uh, where it comes from. So how does Big Eye uh, see data quality um, as a space and how can teams address it uh, more efficiently? Let's talk. Uh, in order to understand this, let's talk about this three phase approach to data quality. Now, we see data quality as a pyramid where each subsequent layer of the pyramid depends on the previous layer being uh, fully implemented and stable before you can move up the quality pyramid. Now, we've broken down this pyramid into three different phases and looking at the phases from bottom to top, you can see the sequence in which most teams tend to implement data quality and which ones are the most important. The bottom layer is this operational quality of just the, are the basic fundamental concepts of the data quality present. Is the data on time? Is it complete? Um, are there any duplicates or outliers? 
This is also the largest part of the pyramid because this is usually where the most time and effort is focused on, and it is the largest spanning part of the, your data quality solution. The second phase is logical quality, which gets into defining rules that are specific to your industry, to your business, that help you determine whether data is usable or not. And finally, the third phase is application quality, which is this holy grail uh, where the right data is always used in the right way for the right task. So let's walk through these phases and dig into them a little bit more and see how they build on top of each other. The first phase of this pyramid is operational quality. As I mentioned, these are really the core fundamentals of uh, the data and whether it's in a usable state or not. The, the most common questions that we hear data teams ask are around these sorts of operational basics. Do my uh, columns have any nulls? Is my data being populated on time? It, are my, my ETL jobs running and actually computing the right amount of data? Are we double processing anything and do we have any duplicates? This sort of operational quality is important across the whole warehouse and not just for individual tables. Because it reaches every single aspect of your warehouse, this is usually the hardest uh, phase to, uh, to successfully accomplish without some form of automation. If you manually try to instrument these null and freshness checks, usually either teams uh, burn out and stop instrumenting it, or they miss tables that become important and data quality is lacking as a whole. So once you understand the operational quality of your data and are able to instrument it in a more or less automated fashion, the next level of quality that is important is this logic quality. And logic quality builds on the previous uh, fundamentals of operational quality where it's important to understand what the shape of the data is, whether it is complete, whether it is on time, before you can start implementing business specific logic. In this case, business specific logic might look like a user can't place an order before they, uh, they signed up. Uh, charges to a credit card can never be negative. These are checks that are specific to either your organization, to your business, to your industry, that you would want to assert about the data before you use it for any meaningful reporting or uh, pro uh, use it in some processing for possibly machine learning models. Without having logical quality in place, you don't know whether the assumptions that the business is making about the data are correct. And so this is a very important phase to ensure holistic data quality. And the last phase of uh, the data quality pyramid is this application quality, where as we say here, the right data is used in the right way for the right task at the right time. Now, this is usually this holy grail of um, master data management, data governance, where everybody knows what data is available, where it's located, what the state of it is, what should they use and should they not use, and are able to access it in an easy and efficient manner. The reason that this uh, third phase is on top of the previous two phases is because without understanding whether the data is landing on time is complete and whether it conforms to some business uh, assumptions and requirements, you'll never be able to achieve this um, the state where the data is in a known state and everybody knows which data to use for which tasks. So let's talk about the journey that a lot of teams um, take on their way through this um, three-phase uh, data quality pyramid. So most data quality journeys start off with a very manual approach. Now, I've written checks like this hundreds, if not thousands of times myself, where before you use some table, you write a check for how many records are null, what was the last time this table was updated? Uh, what's the a min and max value of a specific column? These, these SQL checks are then 
copy pasted across multiple applications. There's no consistency between them and they're very ad hoc and um, depend on who is actually using the data and what they want to know about it. Now, obviously this works if you have a few data sets that you're worried about, but as we talked about earlier, data has been scaling faster and faster. And so there is actually a necessity to scale this out a lot uh, sooner than you would otherwise. And so the second step that most teams get into is uh, the, an approach with that includes a little bit of scripting, but is still semi-manual, where you can create a configuration file like I did here in YAML that specifies which table are we checking for which type of metric and potentially what are the different allowable values for that uh, for those checks. Now, this is great, and this lets us scale those that manual approach in a much more efficient manner across different teams and across different users that where the table ownership might be distributed across the whole organization so everyone can write their own configuration. Now, the problem with this approach is that the expressibility slowly starts to uh, deteriorate. In SQL, I can write practically anything I would want in my data quality check. But when I'm scripting it, I now have to understand what are the different patterns that we have as a business and which ones should I encode in my data quality solution. Also, because scripting is in, in, in SQL, you now have to train your users to um, write these checks and understand how do they express them in this configuration and when does this configuration run and when do the, are these checks performed? So there's a little bit more overhead than you would have by then manually checking it, but it is also much more scalable. Finally, the third step in this journey is really to build a full-blown in-house tool. This is the approach that a lot of large companies take. This is the approach that we had at Uber. We had a system called Trust. Um, Intuit has a system called uh, Circuit Breakers where they monitor data quality within the pipeline and they stop the pipeline when data looks incorrect. Netflix, obviously their per personalization systems are a large revenue driver for them. And so they are building very customized in-house tooling in order to monitor the data quality for their personalization systems. Now, this approach usually ends up being very extensible and very specific to the company that is implementing it. And it could solve 80, 90% of Intuit's problems and Netflix problems, but it also requires a lot of maintenance and a lot of effort. These companies can afford to staff a two to $3 million a year engineering team in order to only build in-house solutions uh, for data quality. Most organizations can't afford that and really shouldn't need to. They should focus on what's important to the business and be able to re rely on existing tooling in order to help them with their data quality. Um, with their data quality. So as teams uh, progress from that manual approach to the scripting and configuration to of potentially a full in-house tool. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls that these teams and engineers encounter. So the first uh, major pitfall is really the problem of manual integration and maintenance. We talked about this in the manual approach and in the scripting approach, but the problem with a lot of these initiatives is that they scale with people instead of technology. The users, uh, who are humans have to go and implement seek these SQL queries. They have to write their own configuration file and they have to constantly update all of these checks. And that makes it prohibitive to scale out to thousands um, of data sets. Also, the problem uh, then turns to tribal knowledge where the people who are implementing these checks are the ones who understand them the most. 
And there is usually a lack of documentation and automation around this, where if that person changes teams or leaves the company, then a lot of that information is lost and somebody has to go back and try to understand what was built and why. Also, finally, a lot of data quality rules change over time, and it's important to automate away the process of updating this as much as possible and keep up with the business. If a column used to never be null, but there is a, uh, the business has changed and that column is no longer used in your data set, maybe it is allowable for new records to come in uh, with null values in the column. However, if you're manually instrumenting these checks and have this configuration, you will then have to go and manually update the allowable thresholds for when does the data quality rule trigger. The second pitfall that we commonly see is building a tool that is used by uh, usable only by engineers. The data engineers are usually the ones who are responsible for the uh, availability and for the uh, freshness of and the operation of the data warehouse and the data inside of it. The problem with making the engineers be the ones to implement the data quality checks, however, is that it creates a massive blind spot for implementing business knowledge. Users of the data, such as analysts and data scientists, often have a much better understanding of what the data actually means to the business what are the allowable ranges and without having a way for them to contribute back to the data quality system there is going to be a, a large gap in these expectations going back to that pyramid especially at the logic quality layer the the other two problems uh, that uh, occur with this is that this actually excludes people and creates an us versus them environment where the data consumers, such as the analysts and the data scientists, think that it is solely the responsibility of the data engineering team to maintain the quality of the data in the data warehouse. And they have that expectation when really everybody should be contributing to the same cause of high quality data in your company. And finally, the, there's an issue of just underestimating the problem. When teams set out on their data quality journey, they often look at core checks in that operational layer, such as latency of the data and null checks and row counts, and think that this should be pretty easy to scale out, which is where we get into that scripting solution. The problem here is that expressing a few checks is very easy but expressing and instrumenting and managing hundreds if not thousands of checks becomes exponentially more difficult. And this requires a lot of automation on the side of the tool that you're using. Also, that covers the notion of what do you want to check and what sorts of um, data quality rules would you want to express, but it also, it doesn't touch on the on setting effective thresholds for those rules. Expressing something like a column should never be null is very straightforward. Ex uh, but expressing how many records you uh, should receive on a daily, on any given day is a lot trickier. Many businesses are seasonal. And so it's hard to simply set a flat threshold of there should be at least uh, 100,000 records because maybe on the weekends, your business uh, has less traffic than on the weekdays, and it could dip, but that is a normal part of the business process. Also, as the business evolves, these thresholds will change, as mentioned before with the null example, where column used to be not null, but now is uh, allowed to be null. Finally, there uh, is a, there needs to be a large variety of types of checks that are instrumented. And this expressibility is really hard to predict and understand right out of the gate. This usually comes in closer towards the logic quality layer, where the business needs to instrument some very specific logic in these checks. And without, having, without thinking about that upfront, it's very easy to build a system that 
makes it either difficult or impossible to express those kinds of checks. And this is a common pitfall with the uh, middle part of the journey, that scripting solution that we've seen before. So now that we understand a little bit about the pitfalls uh, that teams experience across the, uh, on this journey, let's uh, quickly look at how Big Eye can help you uh, on your path towards better data quality. So Big Eye really tries to take an engineering approach to data quality. As we mentioned in the uh, history slide, the same way that software engineering and DevOps have evolved into monitoring and observability, Big Eye tries uh, to apply the same patterns and practices to the contents of your data. Big Eye connects directly into your data warehouse in order to collect metrics about the state of your data. Uh, freshness, uh, how up to date is the table, row, row counts, averages, nulls, all of these metrics are then collected and recommended to you through a process called auto metrics, where you can easily deploy more of them across larger number of data sets without having to copy over configuration or uh, SQL. And as you deploy these metrics, Big Eye can automatically set the appropriate thresholds based on what your data looks like. If you have seasonality, Big Eye can adapt to that and set thresholds appropriately. If your column is never null, Big Eye will also detect that and tell you that without the user having to specify any extra configuration. Finally, Big Eye continuously monitors the state of your data as your data changes, as your business evolves, as your ETLs change, Big Eye will track the, the health of your data. And if any of these metrics look out of bounds or like they have um, like they are problematic, Big Eye will send notifications to your favorite um, channel, such as Slack, email, PagerDuty, or to your own internal systems through webhooks in order to help uh, notify you of the issue or potentially trigger some resolution in your internal tooling. Big Eye takes a, a very um, automated approach towards a lot of this because of all of those pitfalls and that we've covered earlier, where a lot of them boil down to needing requiring more automation in order to scale more efficiently. And by having a UI and a way to navigate and look at all these metrics and time series, it allows the whole business to contribute to the data quality solution, moving you up the pyramid as fast as possible. So awesome. I, I wanna thank you all for joining this call and I will pass this off to Nolan. Awesome, thanks Igor, that was a great presentation. Uh, and for anybody who's interested in, in Big Eye, I encourage you to visit uh, bigeye.com. Um, and this webinar will be available shortly. So please uh, watch it again or share with your colleagues. Thanks a lot for everybody who attended.